to Alan John Shamating, who has announced a movement for change for Ghana, an independent presidential bid to break the duopoly of the NDC and the MPP. Very interesting route you chose because you explained there's a difference between what the delegates have and what the generality of voters are. But I'll be quick to point out to you that the parties have a machine, yeah. which is why when you have district level elections and they're not involved, people don't turn out. Mm -hmm. So we cannot downplay the importance of the NDC and the MPP yeah. having a stranglehold on the voting and electoral process. Yes. So choosing to go independent, yeah. it, how that's a serious route to choose, isn't it? Yeah. I'll explain to you. Apart from the arithmetic around what you would describe as the support base of a political party, mm -hmm. the, the arithmetic that we just went through, mm -hmm. that they are super delegates, they are delegates, but what is their number? As against the number of people who vote mm -hmm. for the party. That is a serious part of this arithmetic. So I'm saying that, number one, as an independent candidate, mm. whether the party likes it or not, let the occasion arise and they will see how much of that base I will harvest. Because we are not talking about delegates now. We are talking about the 6.5 million people who are not delegates and who are looking for people who represent the true ideals of their tradition. So that's one part of the argument. The second part is that the political ecosystem mm. and philosophy and the foundation that we have now drives us more towards an executive presidency. I mean, people talk about, oh, it's a hybrid. But the truth of the matter is that power is vested in one person, mm. the president. Now, if that is the case, then does it not make sense that people who are selected and elected as president must be elected on their own merit and not on the back of a political party? Let me make my mm. argument. Mm. This is one person, the president. I'm not talking about a current yes. president. I'm not talking about the president. The position. All power is vested in one person. Now, if people are being, I would say, uh, proper mm. in conceptual uh, political thinking, mm. then it would make sense that there is no reason why the person who eventually becomes president must feed on the reputation of a party. Because when you become president, you are president for the whole of Ghana. Mm. And you are there representing all Ghanaians. Mm -hmm. So the issue of a party being the basis, the vehicle, the vehicle for delivering a candidate to become president in an executive presidency, for me, is flawed. Mm fundamentally mm -hmm. because when you have that situation arising mm -hmm. then it is anticipated that when that president is voted into power then you defend the interest of the party it is normal how do you resolve the issue of this president the constitution yeah. says has to choose at least half of his ministers from certain mps uh, he should choose from his own party but that's the point. So if he comes as an independent without a party. Yes. It's very simple. So this leads me on first, you know, I'm talking about a movement for change. Yeah. And there are four dominant themes underpinning this movement for change. One is that we have to move as a country beyond the duopoly mm. of NDC and MPP. Mm -hmm. Everything happening in Ghana now is politicized. Mm. And it's politicized because of this divide between NDC and MPP. Everything becomes a fight. So if we are serious about sustaining our democracy, then we have to move beyond this geopoly. That is the first element in the change agenda. 
And within that first element also is democratizing the internal processes of our party. The level of monetization and the level of influence and intimidation that can be occasioned by leadership. And I'm talking leadership mm. and not the rank of in a party. Does not reflect the elements of true democracy. So when we talk about change, it is not just going beyond the duopoly, mm -hmm. but there should be a sense of democratic internal processes mm. within the parties. So gradually, each party now has to move to one by one vote. Because when people get to that one by one vote, mm. can you buy the 6.5 million people? No, I understand that, sir. My, so so my, that's one. My, my question, though, is that yeah. the Constitution appears I was going, to, I was going to come. I was, no, I was going to come to that. Independent no, I was going to come person. to that. So I'm saying that the first change element is what I've discussed. Yeah. The second one is that my movement is working towards bringing into existence a government of national unity. Okay. A government of national unity is intended to bring peoples from all walks of life, from all political uh, persuasions, without, uh, without, without any restriction, and then also other non-state actors. Now to be part of a government of uni a national unity, which would then make the decisions about let's say, appointing ministers, because you are talking about appointing ministers. So in a government of national unity, you appoint ministers from NDC, from NPP, from CPP, and other people who are apolitical. So then the issue, the constitutional provision that you are referring to, does not become a problem, because you are required by the constitution to appoint at least 50% of your cabinet or your ministers from... Uh, so you have no problem with that provision? No. So I'll, even as an independent president, yes. you will still work with the parties in parliament? But that is the whole point. That is the whole point about being an independent candidate. Okay. Otherwise, I would have formed a party. I did not choose the vehicle of forming a party because Ghana does not need new parties. What Ghana needs is a new leader that would bring sanity into the political division in our country now. And so if an independent candidate is president, mm. he is free to choose ministers from any party because they did not bring him to, to power. And that, so, that is understood. Yes. Yeah, so but what about the machine to organize the campaign and the election? Well, then we are coming to a, a different operational question, question now. The operational yes. question. I, 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 I've heard your first answer. So that is the reason why you need a movement. You are an independent candidate. You need an organization behind you. You don't want to use the vehicle of a political party because that provides additional challenges. So. You are going there as an individual on your own merit. That's what leaders are for. But you need an organizational vehicle to support your campaign. And that's what a movement is about. So a movement then provides an avenue for mm. people even from the political parties, including, let's say in our case, both MPP and NDC, who buy into the ideals of the movement to remain in their parties but also join the movement. It is not contradictory. They can remain in their party. But what is wrong with that? I mean, you so on election because, day on election day we are two elections. Remember, I think people get confused about this. There are two separate elections. There's a presidential election and there's a parliamentary election. If you are MPP member you don't need to leave MPP. You can stay in your party, vote for your preferred parliamentary candidate. The same thing applies to NDC. But when it comes to the presidential election, 
then you are now voting for the individual who best represents the... But, but no yeah. man can serve two masters. So if I'm yeah. a police station agent for yeah. MPP in yeah. Adenta, yeah. my job is to protect the ballot for both my presidential candidate and my parliamentary candidate. That's how they'll be trained. So how, yeah. why will they be your agent at or support you at the presidential level yeah. and then support the NPP or NDC at the parliamentary level? Oh, but that's an operational question. It's an operational question because what I'm saying is that, let's say, if Mr. A, Bernard Avley, mm -hmm. is a member of NPP, mm. now he believes that he would like to stay in NPP, eh? mm. but believes that when it comes to the presidential election, that he prefers Alan as mm. the candidate to become president. What is wrong with that? There is no intrinsic uh, misalignment. But, but um, why would you be surprised? In Benin, <laughs> Benin, the president now came into office as an independent candidate. So you are not necessarily going to have independent parliamentary candidates no. on the movement for change. No, 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 no. You That's are just Alan for president. Alan for president because I'm saying that the executive presidency model that we are using in Ghana requires us to vote for an individual who becomes president on his own merit, not on the back of being sponsored by a party. Good, is, is, good, fair enough. Yes. What makes you the man for the movement? Because there is a sense of exasperation with the two leading parties. Yes. That is without question. Okay. And there appears to be a movement boiling up to 2024. Yes. That is also without question. Okay. But the question is, who is that man? What makes you that man to lead that movement? So very simple. One is the vision of change itself. I mean... Somebody has to lead that process of change. Because as you are saying, if you go around the country, there is an apparent test for change. Everybody is talking about change. Within the NDC, people want change. Because somehow, they feel that President Mahama, his heart is, is, is term. They are looking for change. But somehow they voted for status quo. I'm not talking rank and file. That is the thing. Because in MPP, people are looking for change. It's the same thing. The vice president is an extension of the status quo. You see, people don't realize that when we talk about presidency, it's a ticket. You cannot divide that. It's the president, president and vice president. It's a combined ticket. So, in a vice president, it's an extension of the term. You understand me? And people want a change, even within MPP. They know that. So, what you are saying, you are confirming what you've been hearing from people. Because that's the first thing. You said it's apparent. People are looking for change. So, I'm saying that I'm providing myself as that alternative to fulfill the test for change. Now you would say that, okay, why are people looking for change? They are looking for change because they feel that the economy must come, must be put to work. They need jobs. Um, they want to bring decency into politics. They are looking for respect for rule of law, for discipline. So many things that people are looking for. They want somebody with the vision. But they want somebody also with competence, demonstrable competence. And they want somebody also with integrity to deal with the challenge of corruption. And they want an action man. So these are the four cardinal, I would say, elements of vision, leadership. Vision, integrity, vision, competence, competence, integrity, and action. What about the fact that they would want a person who is not part of establishment? Throughout this interview, what you've done is to tell me that you are a core part of establishment. Yeah. From 92 yeah. 
all through to ambassador to U.S. Yeah. to trade minister. You are yeah. the longest serving yeah. trade minister yeah. in the history of Ghana. Yes. So you are a core part of the political establishment yeah. that has filled Ghana. Yes. So what all of a sudden, the, the, so the, why should all of a sudden yeah. they vote no, for you because no, you left them? Because MPP? even within the establishment, they can see a different man. They see that there is one man within that establishment who has a different perspective about where we should be moving this country. As demonstrated, and by, as demonstrated by what? Oh, but the kind of things that I've done was part of the... What about principal was, positions? Was, was part principal of the positions? government. No, the question, yesterday I yeah. interviewed people from the, the Hey Julo group. Okay. Uh, hey, sorry, yeah. Julo B group. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me. And they said, what principled positions have you taken, for example, against corruption, or against the economic agenda of the current government to show that you stand with them against what establishment has brought them to? What example can you share? Oh, they are talking about a change in economic circumstances. Is that part the of principle it? stance? Because you're saying people are tired of corruption, yes. economic underdevelopment. Yes. When has Alan come out to say, this is my position on this matter, where the whole party or the whole government is going on a different route, to show that you are the champion they are looking for? Ah, but <laughs> does it have to uh, be that I have come and, let's say, for example, if a party takes a position eh, in a certain direction, does it require the Minister of Trade and Industry to be speaking on corruption? Does it require the Minister of Trade where the Minister of Finance is there? I was not appointed to do the job of the Minister I'm of Finance. I'm talking about a principal position on issues. For, well, example, okay, for example, IMF. Yes. We went for IMF. Yes. June, July 2022, the President announced it. Yes. We did not hear you say anything about whether that's, you thought... That, you see, that's the unfortunate thing. And I can put it on record. And the Minister of Finance cannot deny this. And the Vice President himself cannot deny this. I'm a member of the, I was a member of the Management Economic Committee. And the people who have been part of the system will tell you that I was the one who, at the time when it became clear that the numbers were so bad, I made a very strong case that we're not going to listen to the willing of the Minister of Finance again always giving excuses about what it can turn it around. I made a strong at the empty. I mean, I don't think that we should deny the people of this country of understanding how things have unfolded. I made a very strong case that the Minister of Finance has no basis for going around saying that we will not go to America because he's, he's unable to provide any alternative. I made a strong case that... At the time the E-Levy was being debated, where time, he said we're not going to IMF. Well, I mean, before then, in other cases. So, I made a strong case wow. that where we are now, or where we were at that time, we have no choice. And you can ask, if people will be true to themselves. I would not have responded, except because you're asking. No, because so, but I'm saying that, yeah. immediately after that, this is when the president agreed to the position taken by the EMT and started making calls. Against the wishes of the finance minister? Oh, obviously, but he, the finance minister cannot deny this. He made it clear that he was not in favor of uh, us going to IMF. So when the, the president finally made the decision, I was the first person in leadership position who went publicly to defend the position of the IMF. That, I'm surprised you, you, did, you didn't know this. I came out on my own. Nobody instructed me to go. I think the first time was uh, Good Evening Ghana. I made a solid case why the minister, did you hear the vice president ever talk about IMF? Or did you hear the uh, minister of uh, finance come to defend? I'm talking about in the early uh, uh, weeks and months following um, I went out publicly to defend it. So I'm surprised that you didn't pick Fair this enough. up. But if NDC and MPP have not transformed Ghana and you've been My agenda, leading yes. in the MPP, indeed trade ministry is yeah. possibly the third or fourth most important pick of yeah. any government anywhere. Yes, yeah. 
do you take responsibility yeah. for the failures of this government? <laughs> hey, Bernard, this is a, a major statement. Do I take responsibility for the failures of the government? The, the, no, that not you as individual. Collective responsibility. You are part of the blame for the yes, economic I mean, challenges yes, we yes, face, yes. the I, fact that people are still in poverty, the economy has not been transformed, the exchange rate has part fallen of the to... the government, a senior member of the government. So why would I not take part of that responsibility as collective? But that has nothing to do with the fact that I'm making a case that if I am president, because you see, there are different levels of power and authority and responsibilities associated with, uh, with, with that level of authority. And I've been a change agent for the long while that I've been uh, uh, a minister under President Kufo and then under President Kufo. Everybody knows this. You know. So I'm saying that mm -hmm. the kind of agenda that I have pursued in MPP, both under President Kufo and under President, speaks directly to the message that I'm carrying now. Let's test that. Yes. You were trade minister from 2003 to 2007, mm -hmm. and then you became trade minister again in 2017 yeah. to 2023. Yes. In total, almost 10 years. Yes. If you look at our history of economic development from 1991 yes. to 2020, yes. the average growth rate of industry yeah. has hovered around 14%. Mm -hmm. In 1999, it was 14%. By 2018, yeah. it was still 14%. Yeah. Agriculture came down from 58 to 40. Mm -hmm. Services rose from 29 to 45. My mm -hmm. point is that our industrial fortunes haven't changed that much. Yeah. Industry has not really created jobs. It has not driven transformation. Most economies go from agrarian yeah. to uh, industrial before services. Yeah. We've just jumped to services. Yeah. So what is the evidence that Alan has the magic wand for transformation when he's had 10 years as trade minister? Yeah, but you are getting it wrong, Bernard. You are an analyst. Now, the architecture of government will not support the position that you are advancing. Because for, for the transformation to occur and for industrialization to become the driving power behind any government, the government itself I'm now talking about the president, the leadership, meaning the entire cabinet, must prioritize industry. And mm. when we talk about prioritizing industry, it also then means that the amount of resources are located in a budget to support industrialization matters. So it is not about Alan having been minister and you are saying that you haven't seen transformation. But what I can speak to is what I told you, that in President Kufo's time, when people were talking about the golden age of business, and celebrating that, oh, things were, you know, how did that come? Was it driven from the uh, office of the president? I would say that part of it was what I was doing in my ministry. But was there transformation? We are talking no, about but it was not industrial transformation. Industrial transformation. Yes. No, no, so, 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 so I'm saying that the efforts at that time, whether it was the PSIs mm. or what I've done under President Kufu, was all targeted at transformation, not change. The difference between change and transformation is that in, in the change process, these are minute steps over a period of time. Mm -hmm. Transformation means a significant change and a quantum leap. So I'm saying that my transformation agenda has never been in doubt. That was what the PSI was about. But you need to put money and support behind that. Mm. In the current uh, administration, I've been talking and preaching industrial transformation right from the world, 2017. But my ministry was the least funded, or what, let me qualify, one of the least funded uh, uh, ministries. 
Even with one D, one F? You know, it's not everything. We don't need mm. sometimes to... You know. No, just to it understand. Was, no, no, I'm telling you. it was an, announced it as was a flagship one, program. No, but flagship... So it appeared yeah, that so it was see, a, a very... But this is where I think I will make a difference. And okay. this is not to discredit mm -hmm. anybody. Mm. One thing I can say for the president is that even in Kofor's time, he was one of the few people who believed in my ideas. It carried through to his term, and that's why I was the first minister that he appointed. That, I have no doubt about that. He believes in the kind of things I've been talking about. I think his major challenge has been his inability to control the Minister of Finance, <laughs> and then to tell him that, look, this is where my heart lies. So they underfunded this the is where ministry. This, uh, look, that's why we don't need to get into this. You know, this is where he had, he had, his heart lies. His problem is not being able to get the Ministry of Finance to put to the money where his heart is. To understand what he, the president, has been looking for. You know, in his in his narrative, he's always talking about value addition, the capital economy. That's what he's been talking about. So I'll give that to him. You know, so it is, and if I become president by the grace of God, the architecture of budget, our national budget, will change completely. Wow. It will change completely because some of these things, what occurs in cabinet, we swear out of uh, you can't secrecy. Say it you can't say I it I only lead you to temptation. But I'm just, you're only leading me to temptation. <laughs> but even to... No, I'll take a break. So that when we come, we'll wrap up by you telling us your top three priorities for Ghanaians okay. and how you hope to improve their lives yeah. as an independent president. Yeah. Alan Chamatin is only warming up. <laughs> we'll be right back. Stay with us. neighborhood i'm having my toys the very reason why i took it for us see the price is very good and it's spacious to contain all of us alpha med city now i'm a landlord i don't pay rent and my airbnb business is booming to be permanent bank and i'm in the city and i say alphabet city the pension pay me 20 percent the payment plan i want to share my man to say and you're very smooth this is a healthy place to raise our families and create in peace. Come on, be my neighbor. Alphabet City, the ABC of home sweet home. Alphabet City is a classy and peaceful gated community in Sakumono. We have 24-7 top-notch security and high-quality access roads. We have three bedrooms and two washrooms. Three bedrooms and three washrooms with boys' quarters. We have three bedrooms and four washrooms. We have two bedrooms and two washrooms, all with beautiful kitchens and kitchenettes. Call Alphabet City on 0240-111119 or 050-449-9999. Alphabet City, the ABC of Home Sweet Home. An African Savings and Loans is a subsidiary of EcoBank that was set up to take care of the underbank, the low income, and the unbanked population. The institution was set up in 2008 and has been working in the markets over the years. Pan African Savings and Loans clientele is made up mainly of women, women traders, women farmers, women artisans. At Pan African, we believe in serving our customers holistically. That is why we are excited to bring to our women the MAMA program. MAMA by Pan African is for all women, especially you. Join MAMA today to access a full range of financial services that include credits and savings, as well as accompanying services such as financial training, digital training, networking, and telemedicine. We have partnered with Glyco to provide you with 24-7 access to a medical doctor. Wherever you find yourself, all you have to do is pick your phone and call the number that you'll be given and you get free access to a medical doctor. 
All these services are being provided to you at no cost to you. To join the MAMA program, simply dial star 777 hash and follow the prompts. Welcome back. This is the final part of our conversation with Alan Chiamating. We are trying to understand now his ideas for transformation. He's explained how he hopes to use the independent party vehicle to, 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 to win, which a lot of people think will be impossible. <laughs> I was talking about industrial transformation. I need to just qualify the point I was making. Okay. So I was basically saying that between 91 and 2020, mm -hmm. our Greek share of uh, economic uh, output has reduced yeah. from... 58 to 40. Yeah. Services has increased from 30 to 45. Yeah. But industry has remained yeah. the same, yeah. which was yeah. the question I put which we are trying yeah. to address. Yeah. You also spoke about the fact that even though the president's heart was in industrialization, yeah. the money was not pushed to, to support it. Yeah. This uh, morning on radio, somebody wanted me to ask you about Commander Sugar Factory. Yeah. That how come that factory is still not running? It, I, we can't go into all the details. Yeah. Was this just a wrong-headed policy? Just quick thoughts around that. Because I do know there are other industries that have thrived. Yeah. But sugar is a very key part of what we yeah. eat. How come it's been so difficult to, to have a factory to produce Look, it? Commander, right from the beginning, was stillborn. Mm. Uh, it was a white elephant. The NDC made the wrong decisions about and Krumah himself made the wrong decision at that time. But somehow, over the years, that effort was put in to bring it back to life. Now, NDC made an attempt to bring it back to life. Mm. By the time we came into office, the factory itself, even though it had been commissioned, could not produce any sugar. Mm. And so for us, we had been trying to understand the challenges associated with Commander Sugar Factory. And one of the major observations mm. and findings that we came to was the fact that the factory itself was overvalued in the sense that the NDC borrowed 35 million United States dollars to put this commander factory back to life. They attempted to offload it mm. and they went through a bid process and somehow it was not completed before we came into office. When we came into office, because of my interest in import substitution mm. and making sure that we could produce our own sugar, that was one of the first projects that I looked into. I invited the one who won the bid, <coughs> join NDC's time. Mm. He said he was not interested. The amount of money that he quoted in his bid, he said, that he, he didn't expect that that money that he had quoted was going to be used to pay for mm. the shares that were being offloaded. So he said he was not interested. So we did another, right, and this is not about the ministry, this is about the transaction advisor, which in this case was Pricewaterhouse. Because they use, NDC used Pricewaterhouse. So we decided to continue. Then Pricewaterhouse did another round of investor search. There was nobody who was prepared finally to pay more than $15 million for that. A factory that is supposed to be new. Mm. Consistently, the valuation that came in was putting the value of the factory okay. 
at about 15 million dollars. So it means that something went wrong. And in fact, there's been a forensic audit on, uh, on that. I'm, I'm surprised that somehow it has not come mm. out. But I'm saying that the basic challenge then was that the search for an investor has always been compromised by the fact that on the books, you are talking about 35 million, whilst the value itself it okay. is around 12 to 50 million. Fair enough. But secondly, also, mm -hmm. the amount of work that was put in during the NTC time and the engineering that was required was never completed. Mm. So our first task was now to try and get it back to work. Mm. That, that was, uh, once you get it back to work, then you look for some new investors. Maybe by that time, okay. yeah, we went through cabinet, we went through parliament. So all I'm telling you is not... Fair this, enough. Yeah. The other yeah. industry you've tried to change has been the automotive. Yes. Where we have an automotive development plan yeah. and they're assembling here. Yes. yes. But yes. there's been a lot of resistance from the car importers yeah. because of the taxes imposed. Yeah. How do you balance that to convince people who depend on imported cars that you want to create an industry here and therefore we may need to put up those taxes. How, how do you navigate yeah. that? And yeah. will these automotive uh, assemblers lead to any more transformation? Or yeah. is, is that yeah. what no. we should expect? No, excellent, excellent question. The import of vehicles mm -hmm. is the leading uh, import in Ghana. Yeah. Every year, we import almost 1.5 In terms of value. Value. Yeah. So for any country that is seeking to transform, mm. the first thing is to try and domesticate the sectors where your import bill is highest. So that was the first sector that we were looking at. Mm. Secondly, the evidence around the world is that the most, in, most powerful industrial economies also are the ones who have the leading uh, uh, industries, I mean, mainly automobile. Uh, yeah. So from United States to China to Japan to France, Germany, along the one. So they are the leading automobile producing countries and they are the most powerful country. So there definitely has to be a correlation. And so for us, we made a strategic decision that there must be something in the automobile uh, uh, industry that has created prosperity for these countries. And so that's why we put together one of the best, I would say, policy frameworks. And that explains why within a matter of two and a half years, we have five of the six global companies in the world all producing vehicles in Ghana. Toyota, Nissan, Peugeot, uh, Volkswagen, Hyundai, uh, Kia. Well, uh, this could not have but, happened. But you do recognize chance. that in the past year they've been struggling because the exchange rate has been bad. No, no, but, but, they are no, not but, selling. But, no I agree with you. No, yeah, I'm but, just saying you realize that they are in a no, spot no, of but, bother. No, but, I was, but, no, but I explained to you yes. that in itself shows what transformation is about. That you, you have a minister who is able to strategically identify an industry that can propel our transformation agenda and actually go into execution to make it possible for Ghana now to become the new manufacturing hub or assembly hub. How sustainable, for vehicles. How sustainable is that? Yeah, no, but I'm coming. Mm -hmm. So, first, you recognize that it is an achievement. Absolutely. Because I, no I, way. I, I brought so it up. Now, so now, <laughs> mm. We are linking it to component manufacturing. Okay. Because when you start uh, uh, with assembly, and you start manufacturing your components, then you produce the raw materials for the assembly. Now, why am I interested in component manufacturing? And before I left, I started bringing major component manufacturing companies, those who produce brakes, shock absorbers, uh, wipers, those are the components. Now. You know that at the same time, in my industrial transformation agenda, I have identified 10 new strategic sectors. One is 
petrochemical, oil and gas, adding value to oil and gas. When you add value to oil and gas, you get plastics. Now, I've been promoting aluminum bauxite. From bauxite, you get aluminum. I've been promoting iron and steel. From iron, you get steel. If you have plastics and you have bauxite, if you have, if you have plastics, you have aluminum, and you have steel, you have iron, you have the components, a major part of the components that will go into the assembly. So everything that I've been doing is integrated. That's why I was talking about transformation requires you to identify strategic sectors that have the potential for quantum leap and also multiply effect, mm. backward and forward linkages. Wonderful. We'll explore that later. Final message. Yes. What is your message to the, the youth of Ghana and the, the populace who obviously fed up with the promises, the, the politics, and, and really feel like they need a fresh, a breath of fresh air? What, what is your message to them? My message is very simple. Mm. It is very obvious that Ghana is ready for change. The people of Ghana are yearning for a third force. Whether the third force is a new political party or an individual, the evidence is clear. And that is why I'm offering myself to respond to that gap. But then more importantly, if I'm responding to that gap, and I'm talking about transformation, change and transformation, then I have to focus on a constituency that represents that change and the future of our country. The voter, stat voter statistics, 55% of the voter public are aged between 18 and 35. That's out of the 17 million. 9.4 are aged between 18 and 35. And out of that 9.4 million, 2 million are first-time voters. Those who have just turned 80. So the statistics are clear. Mm. And if you look at the level of unemployment, it is alarming mm. for the youth. So if I'm talking about transformation, I'm talking about the future. Then it only means that my base and my constituency must be the youth. And that's why I've made it clear that I'm running as an independent candidate, but my movement is led and powered by the youth. Mm. Completely. So, from yesterday, all the things that I've been doing, it's all been led by the youth. And that's why you, you probably have interviewed some of the young people. And it's amazing the potential that they have. Mm. And so I'm just there as representing the face of the movement. But it is powered by the youth. And the youth are firmly uh, and strongly behind me because they can see that I have ideas that would bring material changes in their lives. Because if you don't have a job, then you have to be able to support somebody who is talking about the kinds of things that will create jobs for you. Mm. All my agenda about industrial transformation, if we had time, we would go into it. All the talk about a new agricultural revolution, if we had time, we could talk about it. How can you, how can you optimize agriculture without doing large-scale commercial farming, in addition to mm. smallholder? So the ideas that I have, both for the economy, industry, and then agriculture, which are the three pillars that would create that mm. transformation. All those things are the ones that the youth are interested in. And that is why, for me, that is my, my well, constituency. We can only wish you well. It's early days. We have about 14 months to the election. We hope we can talk to you again. Does that mean you are hitting the campaign right away? People forget that I'm a powerful campaigner right from the beginning. And I, the, I have a, a full operational structure. Already? Oh, but I mean, you know. Uh, it but you left them people only yesterday. No, no. So 
or is it you mean you mean that uh, when i started oh so it's the same machine yeah i'm saying that i already have a machinery so i can hit the ground running at any time and i'm doing that but i've now brought the youth to the front and center of to lead the of, campaign to lead the campaign so Will they also different. lead your government sorry would the youth also lead your government oh absolutely absolutely i mean basically that's why this is a government that will be our potential a government that will be led by the young people are you a young man <laughs> no i'm trying to check if you are then i have to recruit you <laughs> my listeners will tell you how old i am thank you to, thank you for talking to us we've been speaking to Martin. fascinating conversation a man who's been passionate about politics for many years member of the mpp until this week He's now leading the movement for change, symbolized by the butterfly Afra Franto.